And we're continuing on with the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. We're on the chapter, uh, Rules for Householders and Monks. And uh, we're at the section, uh, the, the paragraph that starts, there are two kinds of meditation, uh, which is an interesting statement. I thought but nowadays we've, <laughs> we've got dozens, but uh, we'll see what he's talking about. Two categories, maybe. All right, so we'll jump in. Mm -hmm. Ramakrishna is speaking, and uh, he's talking with Manilal. And uh, <clears throat> Manilal has says, well, what is the rule for concentration? Where should one concentrate? Right? There's a lot of discussion about should one concentrate by focusing in the forehead, or should one focus in the heart? And one of the disciples asks the Divine Mother that question. Um, well, actually, he goes to her because he has a problem. He's, he's developing severe headaches while he's meditating. And so the mother asks him, where are you meditating? And he says, oh, here, I focus here. And uh, she says, oh, she says, it's much better to focus. I have to stand up, put my hand on my heart and down here. <laughs> it's much better to focus in the heart. Uh, she says, both are fine. But this one up here can cause problems like that. And she says, in the heart, it's much safer uh, to, to do your meditation. So in the heart, I like to find, I like the heart because that's really where the, at least in my own personal playing, I guess, <laughs> uh, that's the shrine. You know, that's, that's where the beloved sits. Uh, Takor says that that's the drawing room of God. That's where God meets his devotees is in the heart and um, so where should one meditate master the heart is a splendid place one can meditate meditate there or in the sahasrara these are the rules for meditation given in the scriptures but you may meditate wherever you like wonderful ramakrishna always so wide open but you may meditate wherever you like. Every place is filled with Brahman consciousness. Is there any place where it does not exist? Narayana, in Bali's presence, covered with two steps, the heavens, the earth, and the interspaces. Is there then any place left uncovered by God? A dirty place is as holy as the bank of the Ganges. It is said that the whole creation is the Virat, the universal form. Of God. This is really quite delightful because he expands practice to every action that we are never in a place where God is not. And so there is never a reason to not think that God is there. And if God is there, we certainly wouldn't naturally ignore him or her or that. You know, if, if it was a conscious knowing that if we had become, were aware that the divine was present, uh, really, <laughs> we would not naturally go on as if he, as if there was nothing happening. And so, you know, really what he's saying here is that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, is the perfect time to become aware of the presence. Right? And you can name that presence or describe that presence almost any way that you want, because all of them would be wrong. <laughs> You know, we can only get, it's a matter of degree on how close we can get to the description, but the, but the reality of the divine will be almost infinitely beyond any description that we can place. There's a wonderful story of a, of a uh, Hindu, uh, not a Hindu, a Muslim monk, uh, poet, sorry, that, was, that went and was sitting in, in the mosque, and he had his legs straight out in front of him because he's an older man and had troubles, and his feet were pointing toward the shrine uh, in the front. And uh, several uh, practitioners come in and see him sitting like that. And they come and they scold him uh, for, for placing his feet toward the Lord. And he says to them very humbly, you know, oh, I am an old man. Can you please pick up my feet and turn me in a direction in which God is not? <laughs> All right. So this understanding... Uh, that God is everywhere present. And that's not to say that we shouldn't respect the shrine, but we should respect the shrine with the understanding that God is everywhere present, you know, that it's not only in a shrine that God is. Uh, the beloved gives us a shrine like that so that we can, we can 
live closer to the way we normally live and still acknowledge God. And so God is in the shrine. So we go and visit God in the shrine. We go to the shrine to do our practice and all of that because the mind works in that way, because we've trained it in that way in this world. That when you go to, a, if you want to see your friend, you go to your friend's house and see them, you know? And so the, the beloved is like, well, okay, I'll have a house. <laughs> and you can come to my house and you can come to my house and chit chat and sit for your practice. You can come to my house to say hello to me. You can come to my house and sing. You can come to my house and dance. You can come in my house and say goodbye if you're going somewhere. So he plays into the rhythm of our ignorance, really, to help us lift our minds till we're, till we're at the point that through practice and through love. Uh, that we come up to become aware of the fact that God is everywhere present, always perfect, and that it stays in our mind, that we're constantly aware, mm, constantly aware of that delightful, oh boy, that delightful bliss that is everywhere present and always available to us. Uh, never is it out of our reach, never is it far away. And uh, going there in the moment it's not so much a trying to remember it. It's much more a not forgetting it. Uh, now, that sounds odd, but see, we don't want to enact our will in any way, if possible. We don't want to exert a will or an influence by, uh, by the ego. And so when we sit to think of God, it is a natural state. There is nothing that we have to do we don't have to consciously oh let me start thinking about that oh let me start doing this you know every time we sit to do practice we always the first thing we do is make ourselves the doer and uh th this is not a clear uh a clear uh, thing that i'm saying because <laughs> it's something that i only just realized or or have experienced in the last few days actually uh that that um <laughs> When you sit to meditate, uh, just stop everything. Don't do, don't do anything. Just stop everything. A and even that doesn't have to be a doing. You know, it's not like, okay, now let me stop doing everything. It's literally just, just come to the end of, of the moment and just stop. Just don't, nothing. And uh, there's quite a natural transition that happens, but you have to stay completely uh, free in 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 uh, in going in that direction. You 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 can't be a doer in it at all. Yeah. And uh, there's there the presence of God is everywhere, and the 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 experience of it is constant. Uh, truly constant for us it's it's never out of reach and it's never not not available and never not apparent to those who simply don't look anywhere else so you don't look at god you don't move your attention to god you don't try and do anything you simply don't do anything and focus on the allowance Allow it. Allow yourself to know the presence. Allow yourself to, to know the bliss. Allow yourself to, to sense the silence. It's a releasing. It's not a doing. And uh, you can do this anywhere, anytime uh, in your meditation. And, and even when you place your attention here, it's not even a go to the heart and place the attention there. It's, it's a letting yourself be in the heart, a non-resistance. Let yourself be in the heart. Don't go to the heart. Let yourself meditate. Don't try and meditate. You know, so it's a, it's a giving permission and a letting go because the only reason it's difficult is because the ego needs you to go to it first, to be the doer, to enact your practice. And that little step right there, we miss so much uh, by being willing to, to mindlessly going through that, that, that little three-step process where we become egoism and then are a doership. We're trying to cut that out completely in the moment so that we're not having a doership at all. We're having an allowance. We're having a relaxation into, the, into bliss, 
into our natural state. And so you don't have to do anything to get into your natural state, but not doing anything when you've been living in an ego for as much of your known life is one of the hardest things not to do. <laughs> and so I'm just throwing that in there. That's not right here in this particular scripture right now, but it's something that's very imminent uh, in, 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 uh, in what I'm studying and what I'm learning. And so I wanted to share it with the people I care about here. <clears throat> All right, but he does get to it here in a minute. All right, so the heart is a splendid place. Every place is filled with Brahman, Brahman consciousness. Is there any place where it is not existing? Narayana, uh, you know, covered with two steps, the heavens. So it's just, it's just coming up with different ways of saying, yes, God is everywhere present. You, you can't get away from that divinity. You can't get away from that infinite love. You cannot escape the grace you cannot um, escape um, that, that wonderful wisdom of the beloved. So the two forms of meditation, he says, there are two kinds of meditation. One is on the formless God and the other on with God with form. But meditation on the formless God is extremely difficult. In that meditation, you must wipe out all that you see or hear. You contemplate only on the nature of your inner self. Meditating on his inner self, Shiva dances about. He exclaims, what am I? What am I? This is called the Shiva Yoga. While practicing, while practicing this form of meditation, one directs one's look to the forehead. It is meditation on the nature of one's inner self after negating the world following the Vedantic method of neti neti, not this not this. And, uh, you know, this morning in, in the vlog, if you watched it, we talked about this idea of not this, not this, because uh, I used it. I, I've, I've never really done much work with that because I, I'm always such a, a big fat bhakta uh, that I, you know, I've never really gone into the, to the Gyanic meditations. But this morning I found myself in trying not to be the doer, I, when my mind was elsewhere, when, when my attention was elsewhere, to bring it back, I would just say, not this, whatever was being brought up in mind, and not here, right? Because I, that, that was not present in my current realm of being in the present moment. So it was artificially being brought in by mind. And I would look at the mind and I would say, not not here, oh, I, not this, I didn't say not this, I said not here and not now, just which meant that I was recognizing that the thought was artificial, the distraction was artificial. And I was saying that distraction is not here, it's not part of this moment, not, not part of this environment, and it's not now, it's not part of this moment. And in doing that, I, I I realized that while I'm saying not here and not now, it was a, it was a double-edged sword. I was describing the thought that was interrupting me, that it really wasn't here and it really wasn't now. But at the same time, those two words are also a command to the mind, not here. This is not the time, not now, you know, not the time or place for distraction. And so you get kind of a double-edged double sword for helping you uh, be. And it's a negation, so it's not a doing. It's a stop going there, and a stop being then, and a, re a return to being here, and being now, which is always the condition. All right, so he says, there is another form of meditation known as the Vishnu Yoga. The eyes are fixed on the tip of the nose. Half the look is directed inward, and the other half outward. This is how one meditates on God with form. Sometimes Shiva meditates on God with form and dances. At that time, he exclaims, Rama, Rama, and dances about. All right, so he's got our two forms of meditation here. Now, these, these are just, you know, probably something about Manilal would bring him to these two forms here. Because there's also the instructions for sitting in the heart and uh, seeing the image of the beloved within the heart. See, imagining the form of your highest ideal sitting in the heart and facing the same direction that you're facing. 
So you don't put, put that in opposition. You don't emphasize the difference between you and the beloved in the heart. You have the beloved sitting in the same direction as you in the heart. And that emphasizes this inner feeling of ultimate oneness. I mean, at first, we're just kind of sitting there behind the beloved. But, <laughs> you know, ultimately, that, that reality expands uh, and uh, we become slowly over many years, perhaps, or perhaps immediately, if you are that sincere and earnest, uh, we have that direct experience that, oh my gosh, here there is not two of us sitting and facing. There is one. And it is the love between me, the, uh, the, the, the smaller I, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the highest, the ideal, right? So it's not... It's not that the imagined image becomes real, the real in our heart, and it's not that the self, be, the the lower self, becomes real in the heart. It's that both of those efforts, because we don't know who the lower self is, it has no definition because it disappears, right? And we don't know who our highest ideal is because we really don't understand our highest ideal. It's sort of a working space, and so neither of those can expand into the reality. But what happens? is the love between the lower self and the love uh, for the, the ideal uh, expands. And that expansion binds those two imperfections into a union, into the perfection of the love that grows between them. And that love that grows between your imagined self and your imagined highest ideal, that love is the presence of the divine. God is that love. And so that's that's the, that is what ultimately brings us to union is that we are lost in love, and all the boundaries disappear, and we are bound together in that oneness. <clears throat> Sri Ramakrishna then explained the sacred word Om, and the true knowledge of Brahman, and the state of mind after attaining Brahmagyana. Master, the sound of Om is Brahman. The sound Om is Brahman, not the sound of Om. The sound Om is Brahman. The rishis and sages practiced austerity to realize that sound Brahman. After attaining perfection, one hears the sound of this eternal word rising spontaneously from the navel. What will you gain, some sages ask, by merely hearing this sound? You hear the roar of the ocean from a distance. By following the roar, you can reach the ocean. As long as there is the roar, there must also be the ocean. By following the trail of Om, you attain Brahman, of which the word is symbol. The, that Brahman has been described by the Vedas as the ultimate goal. But such vision is not possible as long as you are conscious of your ego. A man realizes Brahman only when he feels neither I nor you, neither one nor many, right? So you see, this is where that absolute abnegation comes from. We can't say that God is one because that implies the thought of two, you know? And so that's why we say God is one without a second, so that we don't imply the duality by saying God is one. And so this, 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 uh, um, where I've lost my place completely now, this is why he's saying neither I nor you. So we're not trying to change what we're talking about or what we're looking at or where we are sitting or where we are trying to negate. We're trying to release either concept. We don't want to think about one. We don't want to think about two, right? We don't want to think about I. We don't want to think about you because you cannot have either of those without the other. So we're trying to, to let those drop away. And we're not, uh, oh yes, and so one and many is also not to be done. And so as you sit and meditate, you're trying not to do something, no matter what it is. You are allowing nothing. Right? You are allowing yourself to, to, to not be taken into any form of bondage of thought or definition or boundary. 
and uh, all you have to do is 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 uh, your mantra. Call it Om, or call it your mantra, or call it your name of your beloved, the name of the, your highest ideal. And let let your awareness just allow your. Well, you, this again, it's hard to talk about any of this uh, experientially because it's not a doership. It's it's a very delicate and a very subtle practice, and you'll have to play with it in order to to explore it. Um, it's one of those things that I don't know if it's easy or if it's difficult. I don't know if it happens in ten minutes or if it's because you join a monastery for twenty five years. I have no idea. Uh, so, but this is the notion that we're not doing, we're not attaining, we're not getting, we're not grabbing, we're not changing. We are simply trying to allow ourselves, well, in in truth, to allow ourselves enlightenment, which is our normal state. It's not an attainment, but to allow it to become apparent to us, to allow it to come to the forefront by allowing nothing to act, nothing to be done. And uh, it wouldn't be difficult at all if we hadn't been doing the wrong thing for so many years <laughs> and developed so many bad bad, bad habits around. Ron, so, yeah, yes. While we're like doing nothing, do we I think, think that, that Ron, uh, do we okay. think, do we, do we I'm think sorry. Oh, while we're sitting there doing nothing, are we, thinking about Ramakrishna in our heart. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, we're not doing nothing. <laughs> we're not doing. Okay. So it's not that we're doing nothing. It's that we're not doing. And uh, in that, uh, you don't have to think about, well, this is, this is, careful stuff take a lot of this stuff for experiment all right uh it's not that you have to to think about ramakrishna in your heart it's through this not doing ramakrishna is in your heart he's already there uh, as a matter of fact that's all that's there as a matter of fact that's all that there is uh and so we are allowing ramakrishna to appear in the heart by not doing. So it's just a withdrawal of what you are always trying to do. You see, we don't know what it is to not do because we are always in the habit of doing. We have never experienced not doing. <laughs> and it's, the, it's really the reason that this seems so difficult. But through the not doing itself, all is. Right now, uh, yes, okay. So that 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 is that level of thinking and talking. Now, if that's not happening for you, and the doership just isn't stopping, the ego just won't stop the mind of the noise. The the noise in the mind won't stop wandering, and and you haven't really found the shrine, so you don't have this. You don't really have a knowing of 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 that and all of that. Then yes. It means it means don't do anything else at all except your mantra, right? And follow the source of the mantra, and you will end in the heart, all right? So you sit there and just if if uh, as a means of uh, you know as a working principle, let's say as a working ideal, uh, yes, the mantra goes in the heart. The thought of Ramakrishna is in the heart. Uh, and we work on that as a working ideal, and we try and establish that. Uh, but if you can make put it, make it a matter of faith that Ramakrishna is already in your heart, and by not allowing your mind to wander into different areas and take you with it, that's the problem. It's not so much the wandering mind that's the problem. It's the fact that you think it's you that's wandering, and so you're with it and following it everywhere. Uh, when, you, when you've when you come to realize and really establish yourself uh, in the fact that, that you can't possibly be mind, uh, then then that that becomes secondary. But initially, yes, uh, what, you're, what you're saying is true, but it's a working ideal uh, for something that will become apparent uh, slowly to you.
to us. Does that make sense? And that's not to say that 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 that's a lesser state. All right. Think of the sun and of ten jars filled with water. The sun is reflected in each jar. At first you see one real sun and ten reflected ones. If you break nine of the jars, there will remain only one real sun and one real reflection. Each jar represents a jiva, an embodied soul, right? Following the reflection, one can find the real sun, right? If you're looking down at that pot and you see the sun, you, your mind is able to, to follow that trajectory. And you, you'd look away from the pot, you look up in the sky directly in line with the line of the water, the perpendicular to the water in the pot, and it's going to point to what's reflecting in it. And that's, you'll find your way, right? And so this uh, is a way of saying that Become aware, let me see, see if I can get this all out in a, in a nice line here. Let, the, let all of the change and all of the, the movement and all of the experience of the mind point to the fact that there is, there is a you in there that is not part of it, that is observing the mind, that's not changing and not moving and not going anywhere. One way you can do this, uh, at least the way I stumbled on this idea, actually, I'll tell you, it's kind of a funny story because I was there was a time about, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe, where I was doing yoga. Uh, <laughs> I did a six month stint of yoga in the basement of the Vedanta Center in D.C. with Sushil. And we were sitting there and he was kind of leading the yoga. He was teaching me these yoga postures. But one of the things he was having me do is like, you know, sit there and do this with my arms straight out in front of me. A couple of hundred times. And, uh, you know, at first it's nothing. It's just, oh, it's, it's easy. I can do this, right? Uh, but after you've been doing it, you know, 100 times, 150 times, it, it's quite it's quite a difficult thing to, you know, it's like you feel that fatigue. You really want to just drop your arms and stop. And I was really struggling with that. I, I was like, and I thought to myself, I wonder, I said, well, I wonder if I stop focusing on my moving arm right and stop making the movement my focus and instead put my focus on that part of me that is not moving my sense of self and let the movement of my arm indicate the non-moving self that is aware of the movement of my arm uh i wonder if it would be easier <laughs> it was just that simple i was just trying to find a way to stop that burn in my arm or stop being subject to it and I, it was such a successful experiment uh, that I realized that there's a truth in it, that all movement implies the unmoving, that all noise implies the silent. And so instead of letting myself become disturbed by the things that are moving and changing, I then began to use them to point at that in me, which is not changing, that, can, that is observing the change. And the same thing with the noise, you know, when I was meditating and I would hear someone chopping down a tree outside or some car honking their horn, instead of being disturbed by the changing and the noise, I would allow the noise to indicate to me the silence that allows the noise, the silence that provides space for noise. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is a way of using that. So this is what he's talking about here. Use the reflection. Now, what is the reflection? Everything that you're looking at right now or experiencing through any of your senses is the reflection of God in mind. So let all experience of being indicate that which is the non-experience. Let that indicate uh, the self, that which is observing all of it, right? And so instead of looking at the world and getting involved in all the particulars, See the whole reflection and follow the trajectory of your observation to make you turn your inner eye and to look inward in line in a line directly perpendicular to all experience and allow that to indicate the self, allow that to indicate uh, the observer.
the self and allow you to become intuitively aware of the observer, of the witness. Right? Uh, is that clear at all <laughs> to, to everybody? <laughs> Does perpendicular lines make a point? <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's the trouble. If you if you start taking apart the 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 the, the language, of course, that's why I say in all of this we're always wrong. <laughs> Wanted what happens? What happens when the tenth, the last one is left, and that's broken? Uh, you're free. The mind, you're you're then in pure mind. There's the, you're, once you're in pure mind, there is no longer experience. There, there's no longer a, a reflection that you're observing. Uh, you and the observed have become one. And so there's not an experience, and we really can't say anything about that uh, without being really wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, so in that last, if you break that last pot, that's the last bondage. I mean, that's the last uh, reflector. And so at that point, you're just Brahman. There's, there's, there's no second about it. That's, that would be Nirvikalpa Samadhi, I would say, uh, without thinking about it too much. You know, I think about it, you know, when they break the pots, counting down like three, two, and people go one, but it's like really three, two, zero. Right. But, and, and, but remember here, when he, he, each pot here represents a separate person, a jiva in that sense. So we don't really, please don't think that you have to go out and eliminate <laughs> other divas. <laughs> for your own realization you just have to eliminate your own reflection or uh, yes for now you but <laughs> again see we talk in terms of doing uh you just have to know you see because this is the whole fun of this game seemingly more and more as we go along uh that it's not that there's nothing that has to be done <laughs> it's that you have never done anything and you have to accept that fully uh, by not doing it in this moment. It doesn't matter how long you've been thinking that way. You don't have to draw conclusions about, oh my God, what's going to happen in the future with this. There is no future and there is no past. Stop worrying. Uh, just stop. <laughs> you don't even have to stop worrying. Just withdraw yourself from a mind that worries. right? And so it's breaking attachments. That's really what we're doing. That's the simple approach to it and if, and at first we do that through discernment and and just watching learning to be the observer because all of this is obvious uh, there is nothing about this the teachings of the scriptures that is not obvious uh, if you are the witness observing closely uh, it only becomes unobvious when you start attaching and you're not aware of some attachments and it's and it's distorting your your vision, distorting your view, and things just aren't quite going to make the same amount of sense. The more you withdraw, the more you 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 detach uh, or exercise your detachment, uh, the more of this will become obvious, will become plain to you. Uh, you know, I uh, that's what uh, I'm thinking of. Um, when Swami Tattva Mayananda in San Francisco first came from India, um, he was, I was helping him put his books on his shelf in his room. And I opened up one of his boxes and there was just a whole bunch of handwritten three ring binders that were like, there were like nine of them, you know, that were like that thick. And I put them all on the shelf and, uh, I asked him, I said, what is, what is all of this writing? What is, what is all of this? And I loved his answer. It was so humble of him. He just said, oh, those, those are just some of my unpublished works. <laughs> I, had to, I had to laugh, you know, because, you know, just comparing myself to him, just hearing that statement, you know, my, my unpublished works can, can fit on a dinner napkin, you know, <laughs> it was like, and, oh, and my published works, <laughs> all of my works can fit on a dinner napkin, you know, and here he had these nine volumes. And then I was talking to him about the nature of that and scripture and all this started a conversation. And he said something to me that day that's pertinent to this whole thing. He says, he says, the scriptures are not there to tell you what God is. 
because God cannot be described, you know, cannot be caught. So the scriptures are not there to tell you what God is. And he said something beautiful here. He said, the scriptures exist to tell you what God is not. So that that which is not apparent can be can become obvious or that which is obvious can become apparent. That's what he said. So that that which is obvious can, can become apparent. That the presence of the beloved is obvious if you're not distracted, if you're not wound up in attachments. And so this is what we're trying to do in this whole conversation during our sitting is allowing the obvious to become apparent to us by simply allowing it to be obvious. <laughs> so he says, what remains when the jar is broken cannot be described. There you go, uh, Rena, directly from Takor's mouth there. When that last jar is broken, what is, is Brahman. You know, it cannot be described. And technically, it can't even be called Brahman, right? Because it has absolutely no limit. If you call it Brahman, that means it's not called Charlene. But it is called Charlene. It can be called anything. <laughs> you know, that's Ramakrishna's whole point. The jiva at first remains in a state of ignorance, right? Not knowing the truth of itself, not knowing the truth, period. He is not conscious of God, but of the multiplicity. See, that's that's our problem. We're we've got we we've, we've put the binoculars to our head and we're paying attention to everything that's way over there, and we can't see anything that's near us because we've got our binoculars up to our eyes. If you've seen on YouTube, they have a soccer game where they attach big binoculars to all the soccer players' eyes, and they're trying to play a game of soccer. It's very, very, very funny to watch. Uh, and that, it, it's so funny to watch, but you sit and watch it, and you begin to understand what Ramakrishna is saying here. We're doing the same thing. You know, we're trying to realize God by not being aware of him, by not knowing her, by not, just simply not. We're, we're totally caught up in that which is in the senses, that which is in the mind, that which is constantly changing. That's where we're looking. And we're trying to find uh, the, the unchanging, absolute, beloved, in the world of the changing. You ain't gonna find it, right? Because he is the container of all that change. He is the isness in all of that change. And so, the jiva first remains in a state of not knowing who he is. He is not conscious of God, but of the multiplicity. So we're, we're in the mind. He sees many things around him, right? Because we've chosen to be a particular that is separate and apart from the whole. That's the state of egoism. That's the state of, of living in the world of change. You have to pick uh, a container to protect yourself or to hold your presence uh, in a constantly changing world, right? Because there's nothing that doesn't change in the world of the changing. And if you identify with the world of the changing, you can't do that because you would be going out of existence uh, like everything else is constantly going out of existence. And so when you're in the world of the changing, you have to create a false sense of self out of the changing. Right, You have to take certain things that change and just identify with them in order to have a placeholder for you in the world of the changing. And so when we've done that, that, that placeholder that we create is our ego. That, that thing that says everything out there is God and everything in here is mine and me. Right, This body, this mind, this home, this is me and mine. He says, on attaining knowledge, he becomes conscious that God dwells in all beings, right? So he, this eliminates the need for the egoism. We don't have to have that buffer of safety called an ego. And really all the ego is, is all of our ideas of the past that have been broken down into little bite-sized controllable chunks that give us a safe sense of being a place to hide our ignorance, a place to hide our fear, uh, a place to hide uh, all of our shortcomings, and to cover them with 
uh, actions and ideas that make us look and seem great and to collect a, to collect achievements that make us seem important and to develop relationships that make us seem loving right so we we create all of this falseness in this buffer zone around ourselves in order to create a safe space in which we can reliably continue to exist in a world where nothing continues to exist right and so this this is where we're stuck so on attaining the knowledge uh, he becomes conscious that God dwells in all beings, that really we've never seen anything but God, right? And that's that's my favorite thing to tell people when, when I've been asked many times uh, as a Swami, have you seen God? And I, and I always respond, I've never seen anything but God, right? God is everywhere present and always perfect. And so we just have to develop those eyes that is always recognizing the beloved. We're always looking through the senses, through this imagined, quote, real world. I love it when we say that as devotees, the real world. Yeah, but Maharaj, in the real world, right? Totally backwards. <laughs> totally backwards. We'll talk about some spiritual truth and someone will always raise their hand. Yeah, Maharaj, but in the real world, you know, how do we do this? And it's like, well, first of all, you have to stop saying that. <laughs> you have to stop thinking that way. You can't do that. So we see that God dwells in all beings. Suppose a man has a thorn in the sole of his foot. He gets another thorn and takes out the first one. In other words, he removes the thorn of agyana, or things that take you into darkness, things that take you away from light, ignorance, by means of the thorn of jnana, knowledge. Right. So this, this is... When, when uh, uh, was it Regina or Sarah, you asked that question, I can't remember who said it, but about, uh, is it okay to imagine the, the image of, while we're doing this, are we simultaneously imagining the image of our beloved in the heart? Yes, this is using one thorn to take out another. So we're using our mind, you know, to help us discern and pull out our ignorance, become aware of a truth. But once that happens, we throw out both thorns. Neither of, of them are necessary, right? But on attaining vijnana, that is this knowledge of oneness, he discards both thorns, knowledge and ignorance, right? Because that's the duality. Now we are the whole. Now everything is included. Then he talks intimately with God, day and night. It is no mere vision of God. Right When we imagine God, uh, Thakur in the heart, or Jesus in the heart, or Buddha in the heart, when we imagine that, uh, it's, it's a, a mere vision of God, right? We're trying to imagine it. But when we come to know the real relationship with the beloved, the oneness, the, the marriage, you know, if you're a bhakta, realizing the marriage between you and God, the inseparability, the indivisibility between you and the beloved, then we talk with God intimately day and night. He becomes a part of our thought process. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, oh, I guess that was Sunday in Atlanta. Never mind. <laughs> we talk about, we talk about uh, this constant state of prayer uh, that in a mature, when the devotee is mature, uh, it's like right now we have a constant stream of thought in the mind that we're constantly observing. And through our practice, that stream of thought that we're completely constantly observing and thinking and talking to ourselves in our mind becomes a triad conversation between you, the thinking, and your ideal, the beloved within you. And so you're always sharing, consciously sharing everything that goes through your mind uh, with your friend who is always present, your highest ideal, God. Right? <clears throat> He talks intimately with God day and night. It is no mere vision of God. At that point, God is God is what God is. <laughs> Just stop there. God is that presence. Oh boy, that beautiful presence. Yes. He who has merely heard of milk is ignorant. He who has seen milk has some knowledge. 
But he who has drunk milk and been strengthened by it has attained vijnana. All right, so it's one thing. If you have ideas about God, a philosophy or a religion or a book that you read about God, okay, you can have some knowledge about God and you can share that knowledge and talk about it and argue about it, you know, all of those things that we do all the time. He says, but he who has, uh, yeah, he who has drunk milk, right, who has had an experience of milk, and has been strengthened by it, which means that it has actually become part of his experience of being, uh, has attained vijnana. Thus the master described his own state of mind to the devotees. He was indeed a vijnani, master to the devotees. There is a difference between a sadhu endowed with jnana and one endowed with vijnana. The jnani sadhu has a certain way of sitting, he twirls his mustache and asks the visitor, visitor, well, sir, have you any questions to ask? But the man who always sees God and talks to him intimately has an altogether different nature. He is sometimes like an inert thing, sometimes like a ghoul, sometimes like a child, and sometimes like a madman. Right. So he's saying that there's a spontaneity and a lack of um, uh, sister, I don't know what you'd call that. Uh, the, the, there's a lack of determined behavior in this person. And so he can be, uh, he's sometimes an inert thing. He's just sit there in, in deep samadhi. The body, he, he knows that he's not the body and that he's not the mind, so he's not employing them. He's not identified with them. They are not who he is. And he is in samadhi, you know, and the, the body is inert, completely and utterly inert. And we see that in Ramakrishna, when the doctor was able, in, when Ramakrishna was in samadhi, was, the doctor was able to go up and touch the white of Thakur's eyes, and uh, his eyes didn't even flinch to protect, to protect it. Right. And, and uh, uh, we know that Ramakrishna, when he went into that Nirvikalpa Samadhi for that six months, you know, that he had to be taken care of. His body had to be had to be rolled over, you know, to prevent it from getting bed sores and milk and rice had to be pushed into his mouth. And he had to, you know, they had to induce swallowing somehow for six months. He was in that state uh, like that. So it, that is one way that the Bhagyani manifests. Sometimes like a ghoul. Uh, this would be that Gani that was seen by uh, one of Ramakrishna's disciples. I can't remember who it was. Greg probably knows. Uh, who saw the, 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 this holy man sharing food uh, that had been picked up secondhand in the, in the junk, you know, the dump. And sharing it with this dog. You know, they were both feasting on this gross food altogether. Uh, he, he, a, a ghoul is one that doesn't obey any of the social injunctions, doesn't care about what's clean or dirty, doesn't, doesn't, it's not he doesn't care. He sees that oneness. And when, when, uh, when asked about how, how should I go forward, he's first trying to get rid of the disciple that's running after him to try and ask questions. And when he can't do that, uh, he finally just turns to him and says, look, when the water that is in this ditch, if you've been to India, the, you'll see. <laughs> the ditch he's talking about is this little ditch that runs down the side of every street and it's usually open uh, where all the sewage all of the dirty water all of the, everything runs in there he says when you cannot see a difference between the water that is here and the water that is in the ganges then you know the truth right you know that it's a dream you know that it's all made of dream stuff that, yes. was Hridoy, that was Hridoy. His Hridoy, nephew. okay. It Thank wasn't you. a disciple. <laughs> yes. Well, one day I'll actually have something upstairs. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, so Hridoy, you know, uh, saw, was, was told that. Now, that's a very high teaching, but we've talked about it all the time. You know, in, in your dream at night, in a mind, when you're dreaming, everything that you see is, is mind stuff. And you can see that ditch of dirty water, but your mind has created it out of mind stuff. There is no dirty water there. 
And you can look at the Ganges in your dream, and that is not a river, and that is not water. It's made of mind stuff. And you can easily see what he's saying. These two things, in essence, are God. They are mind stuff. They are stuff of dreams. And as we've talked uh, in ad infinitum about the fact that our waking world is exactly the same, because we're not looking at what we're seeing. We're not touching what we, we, what we are feeling that all of that information is being interpreted through the nerves being de delivering information to the mind and your mind once again is creating a universe out of mind stuff right because that light never goes into your brain it stops at the back of your eye socket and gets interpreted on those cones into ner nerve information and that goes to the brain and the brain creates a symbol for what the eye might be looking at who knows and same for the ear and whatnot so that he's saying that's that's the state of being a ghoul. <laughs> you aren't playing by any of the rules. You're doing sweet things. You're doing disgusting things. And to you, you're just you're not doing anything. <laughs> that's the ghoul state. And sometimes like a child, right? Just pure innocence, afraid of nothing, giggly, having fun, uh, everything. And nothing is real and nothing has consequences in that sense, because there is only the moment. And so the child is just free in the moment to play in the play of the beloved, right? If if he still maintains that sense of duality. Uh, and sometimes like a madman, which means his mind doesn't make sense at all to you because he's not, he's not standing on the same points of reference that you are. He doesn't think of himself in the way that you think of yourself. As a matter of fact, he doesn't think of himself at all. He knows that there is no self there whatsoever. And so he has no reason for his behavior. His behavior is arbitrary and perfectly inspired in the moment just through being. There's no attachment to it, to anything logical or reasonable or that has anything to do with causation. So he looks like a madman, like you can't figure him out. He's crazy. When he is in Samadhi, he becomes unconscious of the outer world and appears inert. He sees everything to be full of Brahman con consciousness. Therefore, he behaves like a ghoul. He is not conscious of the holy and the unholy. He does not observe any formal purity. To him, everything is Brahman. He is not aware of filth as such. Even rice and other cooked food after a few days become like filth. Again, he's like a madman. People notice his ways and actions and think he's insane. Or sometimes he's like a child. No bondage, no shame, no hatred, no hesitation or the like. One reaches this state of mind after having the vision of God. When a boat passes by a magnetic hill, its screws and nails become loose and drop out. <laughs> what a strange, what a strange example. <laughs> I, uh, frankly, I don't even know what to say. I mean, uh, I guess it's an imagined magnetic hill. I've never heard of a magnetic hill. Has anybody ever heard or conceived of such a thing? Okay, so a magnetic hill will just make a hill out of a big old magnet, and we accept the fact that when a boat goes by it, uh, all of the screws and nails get pulled out. Its screws and nails become loose and drop out. Lust, anger, and other passions cannot exist after the vision of God. So that's it. Okay, so the vision of God is going to pull out uh, all of your loose screws and bolts your lust, your anger, your wrong ideas of self. That's We've talked about this actually just in a different way, that Satchitananda is self-correcting, right? That, that, that divine nature, that image of God that has been placed within you, when you live in an awareness of that as your nature, it combs the soul, as it were. It combs the mind. It, it, it puts things in order. It's because we don't know who we are that we act in the ways that are selfish, because selfishness is simple, simply acting in the interests of mind or body, not in the interests of self or soul. And so, <laughs> all right.
Lust, anger, and the other passions cannot exist after the vision of God. Once a thunderbolt struck the Kali temple. I noticed that it had flattened the points of the screws. It is no longer possible for the man who has seen God to beget children and to perpetuate the creation. When a grain of paddy is sown, it grows into a plant, but a grain of boiled paddy does not germinate. He who has seen God retains his eye only in name. No evil can be done by that eye. It is a mere appearance, like the mark left on the coconut tree by its branch. The branch has fallen off, only the mark remains. A beautiful statement, no evil can be done by that eye, because the very definition of evil uh, is, is uh, egoism. Egoism is attachment to body-mind, and it's the mind that causes you to run after particular things that are of no interest to the soul. Right, and, and if you think that you are that body that runs after things that have no interest in the soul, or that mind which does the same thing, spirals in on itself, uh, then, uh, uh, then you suffer. <laughs> you suffer and you don't know what to do. Because to know what you want to do, the real you, you have to know what you're talking about. Right? If you don't know that you're Satchitananda, you think that you're a body that's hungry, you know, or in desire of pleasure or whatnot, you have no choice but to follow it because you think that's what you are. Right? You don't know the distinction. And so you don't know how to act properly because you're being driven to run after things that are of an interest to something that has nothing to do with you. So by knowing who you are, I am Satchitananda, you know that you don't act out of hunger ever, that you are always acting out of an inspiration from the inside out, not from the outside in, right? The outside in is the world of the senses, the world of change, and that is always a hunger and always a reaching and a grasping and a grabbing. It's always a desperation. But the life of the self that knows who it is, that is aware that of God, the presence of God in all things, and knows that it's that it is Satchitananda, love, wisdom, and being, then it begins to do things that are inspired by love, wisdom, and being. It's not a grasping because there's nothing to grasp. There's not a getting because there's nothing to get. There's no attaining because there's nothing to attain. You are that, right? And you are free in that knowledge. And uh, so he can never do evil because he never acts outside of a knowledge of an unconditioned love and an infinite wisdom. And he is not driven by an ego because he has no identity with body-mind. So he's not interested in those lusts and those hungers and those thirsts. I said to Keshav Sen, oh my, it's 9.06. <laughs> we will stop there for tonight.